So, we come to the second part of Doctor Who's 50, 60th anniversary celebrations with Wild Blue Yonder, written once again by Russell T. Davies. Now, I don't know if I enjoy this one as much as I did The Star Beast, but at the same time, it's not terrible, and it does pre present a pretty interesting story. So, we start off in the cold open with a little bit of a throwaway bit, but I don't know, it's kind of funny with the Doctor and Donna in the care of Crashing TARDIS arriving briefly up an apple tree in 1666, where they encounter Isaac Newton, played by Nathaniel Curtis, to which they briefly make a joke at his expense, going, yeah, I hope you can accept the gravity of the situation, to which, yeah, just that joke, oh dear. However, throughout the rest of the story, while they're not entirely aware of the damage they've caused, they cause them to rename it Mavity. Which, I don't know, just found a bit odd. I mean, I really hope they don't keep that going throughout the rest of the entirety of Doctor Who, because that to me feels just a little bit silly just to constantly be calling it Mavity throughout the rest of the show's history. But then again, that, there we go. The story begins in earnest when the TARDIS arrives on a seemingly abandoned spaceship just in the far future. The Doctor, played once again by David Tennant, and Donna Noble, his companion, played by Catherine Tate, exit the TARDIS only for the TARDIS to seemingly disappear. The Doctor revealing that's probably because he reactivated the HADS, the Hostile Action Displacement System, which, when it senses danger, the TARDIS goes away, and will only return when, once the danger has passed. Exploring the ship, they find a robot that they refer to as Jimbo, that seems to be moving extraordinarily slowly, like a voice... A voice and a word will ring out over the loudspeakers, and it'll say one word, then Jimbo will take a step, and then things will just continue on. However, in exploring the spaceship, the Doctor and Donna find out they're actually at the edge of the universe. Like, while Donna is a bit confused about this, stating that from her garden she can look up into the sky and see stars from millions of miles away, the Doctor said, well... Yeah, the starlight's kind of over there. It's just milli trillions of miles away. And ultimately what they discover is seemingly some unknown creatures are attempting to mimic or create kind of doppelgangers of the Doctor and Donna. And apparently this story takes quite a lot of inspiration from the horror movie The Thing, which I'll admit I haven't seen. As I've said previously before on this channel, I never really got the appeal of horror movies. Like, I just didn't really get them. So I personally haven't seen The Thing, although I do know of The Thing. And what the creatures are trying to do is they're trying to mimic the Doctor and Donna so that they can kill the Doctor and Donna and then go back to the universe or back into the main body of the universe where the Doctor and Donna came from so they can take over. Now while I said this does take a lot of inspiration from the thing, I also thought it would this particular episode was reminiscent of other Doctor Who stories. The two that mainly came to mind for me were the tenth Doctor story Midnight and the story Heaven Sent from the Twelfth Doctor. I thought it was kinda of like Midnight well, actually, it applies to both of them, in that both stories involved relatively few characters. I mean, Heaven Sent took it to the extreme by only technically having, I think, four characters throughout the entire thing. The Doctor, the Veil, Clara, and the Gallifreyan Child. To which, throughout this entire story, it's pretty much just David Tennant and Catherine Tay. And throughout most of the story, they do fairly well together. I mean, especially just having small moments where they can just talk with each other. That, I think, really does the story some some good moments. I mean, just Donna talking to what she thinks is the Doctor, but turns out later to be one of the copies, saying that uh, with her family back home, she knows that Sean will probably go back every day to the spot where she disappeared and probably wait for her, but she knows that sooner or later... Rose will ultimately have to move on. She knows that Rose will can kind of move on with her life, and yeah, she might come back once a year to the spot where her, she last saw her mother, but then she will just have to move on. And the CGI that they do with the creatures, in some cases it's a little weird. Like, I remember just seeing the creatures grow in size and get stuck inside the 
corridor that the Doctor and Donna are running down. I thought that was a little bit odd. But at the same time, it's not necessarily terrible. And some of the animalistic instincts, like towards the end of the story, when they're kind of running down the corridor, and then the creature that was mimicking the Doctor realizes it's faster on all fours, that's something like, that's a good trick. I do like that. And it does provide some heart-shaking moments for Donna, like when uh, the Doctor... They eventually find out that the voice they've been hearing is actually a countdown, and that the pilot of the ship, it realised these things were on board, and so eventually set to self-destruct before killing itself so that it, the creatures couldn't mimic it anymore. To, to which, when the Doctor is going kind of running down the corridor, he manages to get the TARDIS back, and then questions Donna as to try and work out which one of her is real, and he apparently he gets the wrong one at first, but then eventually he realises it and manages to throw her out and bring the true Donna back on board. Which I, I do feel that Donna should have possibly been a little bit more upset about that, but then again, that's just me. And the highlight of the episode, I have to admit, is right at the very end, when... We see the Doctor take Donna back home, although he admits he's probably a day or two out, and she exits the TARDIS, and she sees the person waiting for her isn't Sean, isn't her mother, isn't Rose, but her grandfather, Wilfred Mott, in a wheelchair, 90, 93 years old, but he is he is still there, and he, he is just delighted to see her again, and also delighted to see the Doctor pop out, to which the Doctor pops his head down and goes, Wilfred Mott, old soldier, now that you're here, nothing is wrong. Nothing can possibly be wrong. And just, apparently we're not going to see that much more of Bernard Cribbins. Like, this was the, was apparently the only scene that he was actually able to film before his death. And it's just lovely just to see Catherine Tate, David Tennant, and Bernard Cribbins just sharing one last scene together in Doctor Who. It's just, mwah, just, I love it. But then, he... Wilfred says that he's glad the Doctor came back and he's glad he knew that the Doctor would come back to save them. Which, save you? Save you from what? As it turns out, the whole world's going mad. Like, a plane flies very low overhead, there's explosions going on, fire, people running about, and that leads us into the final special, The Giggle, which will debut next week. Can't wait to see what I think of that one. Although, from the trailers, it, we may actually be getting one thing that I know fans wanted from from this particular set of episodes, which was that, while I personally didn't mind it so much, I know that fans were a bit, uh, a bit shaky on David Tennant's last words as the Tenth Doctor. You know, when he's aboard the, the TARDIS, he's, his regeneration is starting, and then he says the words, I don't want to go, which... I personally didn't mind all that much, but in the years since, people have said, well, it makes him seem vain. It's just like, while all the other Doctors have been somewhat accepting of their changes, this guy's just like, no, I, I, I don't want to go. And it's just like, oh, come on, don't be such a big baby about it. But I honestly, I remember crying at David Tennant's regeneration scene back in 2010. So, but it seems that this time he's... He may be getting some better words. Like the trailer that they have for the giggle does actually give a certain line. I can't remember it off the top of my head at the minute that suggests he may actually get a chance to have a proper kind of I'm ready this time. What'll happen with the giggle? Well, we'll have to wait and see. And R.I.P. Bernard Crippens. You know, were such a great man, and this was your last go. We love you, Bernard. Anyway, until next week, see ya.